Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Big Akra Ahmed and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be going ahead and checking out a video from Adam Ragusia and it's called Why Billions of People Won't Eat Pork or Why We Don't Know. So I've never watched this video before. I don't know exactly what to expect. I do know it's put together very, very well. I'm assuming he'll talk about Judaism, Islam, why we don't eat pork, and then why pork is actually such a very, very, very big and popular meat around the whole entire world, especially places like China, especially places like the United States, Europe. Pork is one of the most sold meats. So we're going to go ahead, dive in, and figure out from this gentleman right here, from a non-religious perspective, why pork is so bad or why we don't even know why it's so bad. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into that, and then I'll go ahead and give my reaction and my response as a Muslim to it. Pork has got to be the most polarizing meat, possibly the most polarizing food. Pork is, by some reckoning, the most popular meat in the world, accounting for more than a third of global meat consumption. Yet at the same time, about a third of humanity studiously avoids eating pigs. Now, I can't find any hard data on that last point, that's just a guess, but Islam, of course, strictly forbids eating pork. Hinduism is not wild about pork. It's safe to say that a very large share of humanity thinks that this very popular food is inherently unclean. And why? Nobody knows why. I mean, you might have a reason for yourself why you regard pork as unclean, but I'm here to tell you that anthropologists and archaeologists and theologians have all been arguing about the historical origins of the pork taboo for a really long time, and there is no clear scholarly consensus on the matter. Or rather, there is a consensus that we really aren't sure where the pork taboo comes from historically. We get very little help from the primary source here in the Torah is where we first see pork taboo codified in Abrahamic religious law. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, both written down somewhere in the first millennium BCE. Ancient Jewish law says pork is bad because pigs have a cloven hoof but don't chew their cud. And what does that even mean? Well, cloven hoof means a hoof divided into multiple toes. Here's a horse hoof. It's all one piece. It has no toes. Here's a deer hoof. It's got multiple toes. It is cloven. Cows, goats, and sheep all have cloven hoofs. And ancient Israelites had no problem with eating cows and sheep and goats. Why? Because in addition to having a cloven hoof, they also chew their cud. And what does that mean? Well, one of the biggest differences between you and me and goatee here is that goatee can digest grass and other foods comprised primarily of cellulose. Cellulose is this really big sugar that makes up the main structural bulk of most plants, and we simply cannot digest it. It's just fiber. It passes right through us. But Don't you think it's amazing that in the Torah, even though I'm Muslim and I'm not Jewish and I don't believe that the Torah is properly preserved, but isn't it amazing that in the Torah, God Almighty gives these specific stipulations on what can be eaten and what cannot be eaten. And now that it's 2024 and we have modern day science and we're able to test these different chemicals and different things and different genetics and DNA and things of this nature within animals, we can find out that these specific animals that are described in the Torah, they have an actually, they have a different chemical change that happens while they're digesting food and grass where they can digest this grass and we can't or pigs can't. So for instance, a pig and a human, they have the same digestional tract. They cannot, they can basically eat the same things. A pig's diet is this very, very similar to a human's diet. It can eat the same things as us. It gets sick from the same things as us. We can test like medication and things of this nature on pigs way better than any other animal today because they have the same digestional tract as a human where these animals have different chemicals within them, different enzymes and things like this that can break down the food differently. It can break down the grass and things like this differently. It's amazing that a book 5,000 years ago was able to pinpoint that these animals have a completely different genetic and chemical makeup inside of their digestinal tract. Like how would somebody know that 5,000 years ago? How would Moses know that? And he's too busy freeing slaves from the Pharaoh and splitting the sea. How's he going to know something like that? So I also find it very, very interesting that people deny God and people deny the authority of God and they, they think God is like a game, but then they have no way to explain stuff like that. It's very, very interesting. Um, and there's so much within the religious scriptures that we still don't even have uncovered today. We still haven't even figured out. So ruminants like goaty swallow grass whole. Bacteria in their guts start fermenting or breaking down the cellulose and then comes the gross part. 
Goaty barfs up some of that fermented grass and then chews on it to break it down further before swallowing it again. That is what it means for an animal to cheweth the cud. Pigs don't do that. Pig and human digestive systems are very similar. They basically eat what we eat. Leviticus and Deuteronomy say pork is bad because pigs have a cloven hoof but don't chew their cud. This book says absolutely nothing about why that is bad, and this book is even less help. The Quran here just says that unless you're starving to death, the flesh of swine is forbidden, along with carrion and blood, but some people find a context clue there. Carrion is rotten meat, usually from an animal that died on its own instead of you slaughtering it. And carrion is particularly likely to harbor dangerous pathogens and toxins. Likewise, blood is particularly likely to harbor pathogens that said you can kill them through cooking them, just like you can with any freshly slaughtered animal product. People eat blood all the time. But a lot of people look at this list and naturally assume that the prohibition against pork must have been some kind of ancient health and safety code. This is a theory that gained a lot of traction in the 19th century, when scientists first made the link between the parasitic disease trichinosis and the roundworms often found in undercooked pork. Trichinosis was really pervasive in Europe and the Americas. Before he continues, I do know a lot of people get tapeworms, and these worms that he's talking about, these worms, these ringworms that go ahead, they get underneath your skin, they pile up in there, they're basically parasites that live within your body, and it's caused by the chemical reaction your body has when it eats pork. Um, a lot of people that are also cannibals um, that have come out and talked about cannibalism and what human flesh tastes like. They describe human flesh to taste very, very much like pork as well. So there's this very, very big similarity with humans and pork. Um, the way that, you know, pigs digest and their digestive tract and their organs, they work very, very much like humans. They taste like humans and they give us specific diseases and make us sick. So it's very, very interesting. I know he'll probably debunk this and whatnot. Um, but these diseases and things come from somewhere, right? Um, and if you're only seeing them squander up into people who eat pork, and it's not happening to people who don't eat pork, then that'll give you... ...in the 19th century. Problems. And at that same historical moment, intellectuals in the West were really eager to reconcile religious teaching with their newfound scientific knowledge. And the new understanding of trichinosis imbued a kind of scientific logic into the Old Testament, and that was something that was very attractive to people at the time. But more recent scholarship casts a lot of doubt on the trichinosis theory. The American anthropologist Marvin Harris wrote a very influential book in the 1980s on meat taboos. My contention, he writes, is that there is absolutely nothing exceptional about pork as a source of human disease. All domestic animals are potentially hazardous to human health. That much, of course, is indisputably true, and may have been even more true in the ancient world before we had vaccines. Of course, but you're just making a basic claim. You're just saying, like, oh, you can get sick off eating any meat, so who cares if you eat pork? It, that doesn't mean that pork's not worse for you, or it's an unclean animal. Um, there's things that are unclean, and there's things that are clean. Like, naturally, like, I personally, like, I have gag reflex. I have natural reaction to things. There's a difference between poopy water and clean, fresh water. When I see clean, cold water coming out of a spring, coming down a rock, it looks very appetizing. It looks fresh. It looks nice. I want to jump in it. I want to drink it. When I see poop water in, in, in a toilet or I see, you know, sewer water running down the street in mud, whatever the case may be, it doesn't look appetizing. I don't want to jump in it. It disgusts me. So there's some type of also natural inclination that pushes us away from these pigs, that pushes us away from this animal. We don't see pigs and we're like, oh, look how cute and clean it is. We go, pigs are dirty and disgusting and they and they, they roll around in mud and they eat their own poop. Like, they're disgusting animals. There's nothing clean about them. So even naturally, as a natural inclination, like we incline away from pork, not towards pork. So... That guy's claim is also very, very weird. Yes, we do get sick from different things, but come on, bro. Like, there is there is animals that are more clean and more uh, unclean than others, and that's just, like, a stupid way to look at it is you can get sick off all animals, so who cares? 
means for things like anthrax. Anthrax is a horrible bacterial infection that herd animals like cattle and sheep can pass to humans. There is no evidence at all that trichinosis was particularly pervasive in the ancient Middle East, and there's no evidence that ancient Middle Easterners even knew of its existence. In contrast, there is evidence that ancient people knew about anthrax. Anthrax may have been the fifth plague of Egypt discussed in the Book of Exodus here, and Homer may have been talking about anthrax in the Iliad. There's nothing like that for trichinosis, and Harris argues there's a reason for that. Meat parasites cause relatively mild illnesses in people. People. Most cases are asymptomatic, and the more serious problems can take years to unfold. It's not like a poison that kills you within hours of ingesting it. It would have been really hard for ancient people to make any link between meat and the parasitic diseases that it can sometimes cause. And of course, there's no particular evidence that trichinosis was bad in the Middle East. There's no particular evidence that trichinosis was any worse than any other parasitic disease caused by any other meat. It's simply the case that trichinosis was bad in 19th century Europe and America when this theory was hatched. This is a simple case, Harris argues, of modern people projecting their own experiences onto the lives of ancient people. One of the earliest written specific arguments... Uh, pause. Uh, when it comes down to uh, meat like this and the transfer of disease, um, it's really, really hard to pinpoint like where it's coming from and what's happening. So what he's saying is, yes, the trigonosis, they claim that it was coming from the pork and things like this and help people justify this this coming from the torah or the quran where there's no like real reason why you're not eating pork it's just told like it's unclean and stay away from it but th when it comes down to religion that's what god does god tells you to stay away from many things temptations like alcohol um god tells us in the holy quran stay away from alcohol stay away from intoxicants right alcohol is an intoxicant and intoxicates me i can drink alcohol my whole life some, pe some doctors say if you drink a small glass of wine every day, it's healthy for you. It's good for your heart. I, I honestly don't care what all of the medical procedures say. I don't care if it's going to save my life one day, right? At the end of the day, it's unclean. It's impure. It's an intoxicant, okay? That's what it's labeled as. It's labeled as a stage two drug next to cocaine. So there's a problem when it comes down to it. And God's saying this substance is unclean. It's unclean. Yes, you can drink it and live to 100, but it's unclean. doesn't mean you're going to drink it and die or pass out and die. No, it makes you impure. It makes your soul impure. It makes your decision-making blurry. It makes your connection with your creator less and less and less strong. It weakens it. So the more you drink and the more you eat pork and the more you fill your body with impure, toxic items the more you're damaging your soul, the more you're weakening your body, the more you're weakening your mind, the more you're weakening your soul. And God Almighty put us here as a test to turn to Him, to worship Him. What's the worship of God? Not sitting down on your hands and knees, putting your head down and praying all day. No, the worship of God is listening to Him. Me right now, giving and expressing what the Quran says or you know what God Almighty says. This is worshiping God. I'm worshiping God right now. When I pray, it's worshiping God. When I fast, it's worshiping God. When I'm good to my parents, it's worshiping God. When I talk well, it's worshiping God. When I give to charity, it's worshiping God. Anything that God ordains, anything good, anything that's love that that is permitted by God Almighty within the guidelines and boundaries, that is worship of God. So anything that's good is the worship of God. And I think a lot of people really, really mix that up and they think God is like, like you're just a slave that runs around all day and just like bows up and down and does nothing else but praise and praise and praise. But that's not the case. God actually wants you to live through him. God wants you to live and make decisions through him, not necessarily through yourself. Yes, you're given free will, but God wants you to understand that without him, you're you're nothing. Your free will is irrelevant. Like you don't have choices without God. So you need to turn to God Almighty. And at the end of the day, God's telling us pork is... It's not the same as these other animals. And through science, we figured out that pork is nothing like these other animals. Pigs and humans are alike. This is what the Quran says. This is what God Almighty tells us. Now we know that the pig's digestive tract, its organs, its stomach, how it digests things, its small and large intestines, they work exactly the same as humans. We can test medication on them. We can test all types of things on pigs to figure out how it works within humans. How did someone know this 5,000 years ago? 
or 1500 years ago in the middle of Arabia? So that's really, really the question is a lot of things that God Almighty might tell us to stay away from that is impure, it's not good. He doesn't tell us why. He doesn't give you the scientific breakdown. Especially 1,500 years ago, someone is not even going to understand what that is. They don't know what enzymes are. They don't know what DNA is. They don't know what any of this is. They don't have modern-day science to know what that stuff is. So that's also something you guys have to keep in mind when going on about a subject like this. It's like God Almighty wants you to stay away from things, but he doesn't explain or describe everything. With time, yes, human beings might figure out many different reasons on why. We might die and figure out, well, there was a way different reason that we weren't supposed to eat pig other than all these other reasons that we might have found scientifically. But, yeah. Um, as to for... why pork is bad comes from the Middle Ages, from Maimonides. Maimonides was a philosopher who bridged the Jewish and Islamic worlds. He was a Sephardic Jewish rabbi in service of an Islamic ruler, Salah ad-Din Yusuf, or Saladin as he's known here in the West. Maimonides was Saladin's court physician in Egypt, and here is what he wrote about the pork taboo about 800 years ago. The principal reason why the law forbids swine's flesh is to be found in the circ... Salah Din, by the way, all my Muslims watching, not a, not a fan of Salah Din at all. Um, a lot of these rulers of the Muslim world back then, after the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, passed away, they were very corrupt. They made deals with Jewish rabbis who were trying to bring the Jewish and Muslim world together. As you can see why that is a very, very big problem, working with Jewish Roman Empire um, power posi positioned rabbis. Um, if you as Muslims go ahead and claim that Christianity is changed and it was created by the Jewish people and that they rewrote the religion to make people, you know, worship it, idolize and do adultery rather than monotheism. And you believe all this stuff about the Jewish people and the Jewish people crucified Jesus or, you know, tried to crucify Jesus and all these things. Why would you even trust Salah Hadin, or why would you trust any of these Muslim rulers who are converts, who converted because they were around the Prophet? Why would you even believe or trust any of these individuals who are running empires for power and money and, 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 and using the sword to literally spread and, and, and create a bigger empire and, and, and spread Islam by the sword? That's not how our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, spread Islam. That's not how his Ahl al-Bayt spread Islam. That's not how... God Almighty spreads Islam. That's how the Quran spreads Islam. So why are we praising people like Salah Din and the religion of Islam when people like this literally tied the Jewish rabbis into Islam and completely infiltrated and destroyed the core fundamental basis of Islam? This is when all the sects started splitting. It started getting really, really intense in Islamic literature because they started creating multiple narratives. Then shortly after this, up into the 1700s, what ended up happening, they brought in Abdul Wahab to create a Western curricular for the religion of Islam and all these different things. So be very, very, very careful, ladies and gentlemen, when we're talking about history here and who's doing deals together and who's doing things together. This guy, because he's actually going from a historical standpoint rather than a religious standpoint where he's Shia or Sunni or Christian or Jewish, he's going through history and he's taking objective facts and he's putting them on the table. And I love to see it. I love to hear the names, Salah Hadin and the Jewish rabbi. I like to see these things because these are things we don't hear about in Islamic literature or Islamic history because you're always hearing it from one side of the coin. So it's good to have a refreshed stance and hear it from the outside point of view. Circumstances that its habits and its foods are very dirty and loathsome. If it were allowed to eat swine's flesh, the streets and houses would be dirtier than any cesspool, as may be seen in the country of the Franks. Maimonides there is literally talking shit about the Crusaders. Indeed, pigs are more conspicuously gross than most farm animals. They eat anything. They eat trash, they eat roadkill, they even eat human excrement. And they wallow around in mud, potentially even their own excrement. Is this appetizing to you? Probably not. But here's the big question. Humans are universally revolted by filth. They are not universally revolted by pigs, and why not? Well, one explanation may be that pigs do not universally love filth. Pigs only resort to filth when we humans leave them no other option. This right here is the theory that Martin Harris finds most persuasive. The ancient Middle East used to have a lot more trees, and when- No, honestly, to be, to be completely honest with you, human beings are the same exact thing as a pig. If you stick a human being in a filthy room, he'll sit in that filthy room and he'll become filth. He'll become a part of the room. 
You are your environment. You ever notice like when you dress in nice clothes, you feel really good, you want to do things. When you dress in like pajamas, you just want to sleep. Because the way that you dress or the, how clean you are, if you shower, if you don't shower, it changes everything. It, it, it makes your environment turns you into what you are. Same thing applies to a pig. Don't you find it very interesting? Like if you take a dog and do that, it won't work the same. Or you take a cat and do that, it won't work the same. Or you take a lot, like any other animal on the planet and do it, it won't work the same. But when you take a pig and do it, he's naturally, he'll just naturally adapt to the dirtiness and just lay in sh shit and roll around in it and eat it. Like it's gross. And human beings will do the same thing. Human beings are disgusting. They can go past a specific point of like natural like disgust where they're like, oh no, I won't do that or I won't eat that. And they'll do it anyways. Like a human being, like a dog will never eat poop off the ground. You, could, you can never get a dog to eat poop because its nose will always tell it, don't eat that. It's bad, 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 bad. The receptors in their brain will not allow it to. Instinctually, a dog will never eat poop. A pig will eat poop. A human will eat poop. There's something in a human or a pig that can go past their gag reflex or go past their disgust reflex, like we were talking about earlier, and eat the poop. It can stick it in their mouth, start chewing. It's disgusting. And it's so, so sad to see, like, human beings, they see animals like this, and they're willing to eat it. So I disagree with what he says, like a universal um, disgust on pigs. There is a universal disgust on pigs. If you monitored a pig's daily life, what it did, and you saw what it got into, I think you would be very, very disgusted. And before we continue, I want to go ahead and touch on what the Quran says about pork. Um, here's a couple verses here. Let me go ahead and try and extend the web page. It says, He has only forbidden you to eat Karen, blood, swine, and that is slaughtered in the name of, or, uh, and what is slaughtered in the name of, or, uh, of any other than Allah. But if someone is compelled to, by necessity, neither driven by desire nor uh, exceeding imminent need, they will not be sinful. Surely Allah is forgiving all merciful. So God is saying, Karen, blooded swine are forbidden. They're impure. And if any animal is killed not for the sake of eating or not in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the animal was killed on the side of the road on accident, do not eat it. If someone else killed it not in the name of God, do not eat it. Um, it has to be killed halal. It has to be killed in a way where you're sacrificing it for food or sacrificing it for a specific reason in the name of God. If not, it's impure anyways. So me just going and eating a cow. Now, just, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna break down the difference because it's not just swine. And I know he's using the Quran to justify this and saying like swine is not not good because Muslims and Jews in their religious scripture they say we cannot eat swine. But it's not just as far as that. It's, I can't even eat a cow if it's not killed the proper way. Neither can Jews. Like, they, the cow has to be in a specific shape, in a specific form. It needs to be killed in a specific way. The blood needs to be drained in a specific way and cleaned in a specific way. You have to read a specific prayer on these animals. You have to face them in a specific direction. There's a lot that goes towards it. It's a complete ritual to clean this animal and sacrifice it in the name of God. It's not just like, oh, we can eat cows, but we can't eat pigs. Even when we're eating a cow, we're going through extensional amounts of steps to eat that cow, to clean it, to make sure it's purified. Even though a cow is told to us to be a clean animal, even after we kill it, we have to make sure we kill it in the cleanest way, shape, and form. So it's not just how the Quran depicts the pigs. It's depicting anything unclean. So any unclean animal and anything, like even your blood, your blood is unclean, it's unpure. When I go to pray, if I have a cut and I'm bleeding, I cannot pray. I'm impure. When I pray, we do what do. It's kind of like a baptism for Muslims. We do like a, a, a mini baptism five times a day and we pray. So essentially, same thing. If we have any urine on us, if we have blood on us, if we have any kind of like swine in us or alcohol, or anything that is impure, we cannot pray. We're in an impure state. Our body is in an impure state. God Almighty has left us. He has basically put a wall in between us, essentially. Um... And then the same exact thing here. For you are carrying blood and swine, is slaughtered in the name other than Allah. What is killing, strangling, beaten, or fall, uh, being gored to death. What is penalty eaten in a predator unless it slaughtered it. And what is sacrificed on altars. You are also forbidden to draw lots of de uh, decisions. This is for evil today. This reason give up on all hope and reminding the faith to me. And for okay. So again, he's talking about, God Almighty is talking about carrying blood and swine. And how you cannot eat any of these things. 
Um, say, O Prophet, I did not find what was revealed to me in anything forbidden eating except Karen, running blood, swine, which is impure. So right here is the exact word. It's telling us that if these things are impure. Um, Karen, running blood, and swine. And it says running blood. And this is very important because dry blood is not impure. But running liquid blood that's coming out of a body, it is impure. There's something in it that makes it impure. And it's very interesting because now that we have modern day science, we test swine, we test running blood, we understand that these things are impure. They have impurities. They cause diseases. They cause issues. If I put my blood on your blood, I can give you 100 diseases. So it's very, very interesting that back then, so long ago, no science, no nothing, an illiterate man in the middle of Arabia who's in a pagan society is pulling all of this out, right? He is only forbidden to eat carrion, blood, swine, was slaughtered in the name of any of Allah, was compelled as necessary, driven desire, then Allah is all forgiving. So God is saying exactly the same thing. These things are impure. But if you're starving, if you need to eat it to survive, then eat it. Uh, God is all forgiving and God is all knowing. He understands why you do specific things. Don't think because you committed this sin that I told you not to do that I'm going to burn you in eternal hellfire for it. I understand your situation. I understand what you were going through. This is what God Almighty is saying here. So very, 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 very interesting. Um, and right here is also something I want to go ahead and take into account because like we were saying before, human. what he was saying was Pigs and human beings have very, very similar digestive tracts. They're very similar. We could run tests and medications and all types of things on pigs to figure out how it works with humans. Even in Greek mythology, the goddess of animals could only switch a human to a pig and a pig to a human. It could not switch like a pig to any other animal or a human to any other animal. The only animal that she could switch a human being to was a swine or a pig. I also find interesting that in the Holy Quran, it says, O Prophet, people of the book, do you read up? Uh, Resent us only because we're believers in Allah when we revealed, revealed before us, the most rebellious. Um, say, O Prophet, shall I inform you those who deserve the worst punishment from Allah than the rebellious? It is those who earned Allah's condemnation and displeasure, some being reduced to apes and pigs and worshippers of false gods. These are far worse in rank and further astray from the right way. So, what is God Almighty saying here is that He reduced some of these people, right? from this civilization to apes and pigs. Do I know if he's talking about physical apes and pigs or do I know if he's if he's talking metaphorically? Like they act like apes, they act like pigs or if they're actually apes and pigs, if that's how we see these people now. Um maybe we see them as so as as apes and pigs and maybe they see themselves as humans. I don't know. I don't create the flaws of the world. So it's very, very interesting that the Holy Quran also says that the human beings were converted to apes and pigs. Apes, monkeys, are very much like us. Physically. The arms, the legs, swinging from trees, their faces, their mannerisms, everything that they do. And apes don't have an intellect like us. Yes, we have an intellect where we know where our borders are, we can, draw board, we can do things, we can add, we can subtract, we can do math. Apes cannot do that. They're instinctual still. They follow their instincts. Same thing with pigs. Pigs and apes are so close to human anatomy. Apes physically and pigs internally are very, very much like the human being. It's very interesting that the Holy Quran says that these humans that God was very unpleased with were reduced to apes and pigs. You see what I'm saying? So I thought that was very interesting. I wanted to go ahead and touch on that and go ahead and show you guys that because like I said, in Greek mythology, the the goddess of animals could only turn humans from pigs to humans or humans to pigs and only that. And in Islam, it also talks about how these, these animals are impure, how the pig is impure, just like your blood is impure. So this is an impure thing not to touch. And that God reduced human beings from human beings to apes and to pigs. I don't know if that's physically. I don't know if that's a, a, a metaphorical reference. But I do know that it lines up with Greek mythology, which is very, very interesting that Greek mythology would have very similar stories. Um, and going all the way back to the Torah when Moses was walking the lands of Egypt. So When wild or domesticated pigs hang around in forests, they're not nearly as gross. I wanted to give the Quran a little bit more background because 
he didn't give it too much background. He kind of just read one little verse. But I wanted to go ahead and go through all the verses there and then explain as well about God talking about the conversion of human beings to apes and pigs who were punished. So gross. They root around at the base of trees for seeds and nuts and truffles and things that you and I would be happy to eat. And they don't need to wallow in the mud because they have shade. Contrary to what the expression sweating like a pig would lead you to believe, pigs have no sweat glands. And they have small lungs, so panting is not a great way for them to shed excess heat. In hot, sunny climates like here in the American South, basically the only way for pigs to get cool is to cover themselves in mud. Given the option, they'll wallow in clean mud, but if they have to, they will wallow in their own excrement. The theory goes that over the course of the Iron Age, population growth in the Middle East resulted in deforestation and desertification. Pigs started to have to wallow to stay cool. Then came urbanization, thousands and thousands of humans living on top of each other and filling their streets and their city dumps with food scraps and people poo, all of which attracted pigs who were more than happy to make use of those discarded calories. As people in the Middle East increasingly came to see pigs in this new unflattering context, they started to view pork as inherently unclean. And what's worse, pigs in this context may have come to compete with humans for food. Because remember, pigs can't eat grass. They like the same kinds of foods we eat, like, you know, grains. In, say, ancient Rome, the environment was simply less arid and more rich with food. Pigs and humans didn't compete. Instead, urban pigs cleaned the streets of waste and converted it into delicious protein. That same natural synergy helped make pork the favorite meat of rapidly urbanizing China to this day. Harris argues that in the comparatively arid Middle East, pigs became both gross and uneconomical, a double whammy. The religious prohibitions followed. Pretty persuasive argument, right? But there are counter arguments. Goats also eat absolutely anything, including poop. Jews and Muslims have no religious opposition at all to eating goat, nor do they have any problem eating chicken, despite chicken coops being almost as gross as pig styes, and despite chickens not being able to live on grass either. Those chickens are eating grain, grain that I could be eating instead, directly. They're competing with me, but maybe a little bit less than pigs would. Some more recent scholarship indicates that chickens may have simply supplanted pork in the Middle Eastern diet because they do what pigs do only better. This is a 2015 paper from the archaeologist Richard Redding at the University of Michigan. He argues that chickens can live in cramped urban spaces, just like pigs. They convert food scraps into protein, just like pigs, but they do it more efficiently. They make eggs in addition to meat. Pigs don't do that. And chickens are smaller, which means you can just kill one, cook it, and eat the whole thing immediately. That's a big bonus in a hot climate where meat goes bad really fast once you've slaughtered the animal. Redding argues that chickens were just better suited to the Middle East than pigs were. They simply got there later, and when they did, they supplanted pigs. But if that were true, why would you need a religious prohibition against pigs? Wouldn't people just naturally do the thing that worked better? Well, one thing more recent archaeology shows is that pig eating never really stopped in the Middle East, and it wasn't just limited to non-Israelites like the Philistines. Ancient Jews in various parts of the region ate pig, which makes sense, right? Nobody makes laws against things that nobody is doing. What's clear is that once the pork taboo took hold, it became a way for people to distinguish themselves from other people. Indeed. It's really, it's really not a taboo. It's just like a specific rule from God. Like God's just telling you, don't eat pork. It's impure. Don't eat blood. It's impure. Don't eat poop. It's impure. Don't drink alcohol. It's impure. I mean, like it's, it's not that hard to understand. You know, like, don't rape, don't kill. It's impure for your soul. Like, it, it's not good. You naturally are inclined to stay away from these things. Like, it's natural. Like, you're not going to go run around with a pig and have fun with a pig. You might do 10 dogs. You might run up and down a field, play frisbee, attack the dog, play with the dog. You're not going to do it with the pigs. They disgust you. They naturally are, like, are gross. So, I don't know, man. Like, to each their own. Use your brain, use your instincts. Um, no, not everything that God Almighty forbids to you is disgusting or repulsive either. Like there's a lot of things that might attract you.
there's a lot of drugs that might attract you or things of this nature. But naturally speaking, like instinctually speaking, you'll stay away from most of that stuff. Indeed, this is another pretty recent paper I've been showing you where archaeologists found Israelites from the Northern Kingdom were probably still eating pork when they migrated into the Southern Kingdom around the turn of the 7th century BC. I'm gonna tell you something about Israelites. They, they're very bad at listening to God. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the New Testament, if you read the Holy Quran, we know that Moses went to save these people from slavery because they disobey God. He saved them from slavery. He, they, he split the sea in their face. Like imagine watching the whole entire ocean split in half. You walk through the ocean and then the biggest king that ever lived gets killed by it. Like some Moses, your Jewish friend, your Jewish brother comes and saves hundreds of you, thousands of you from being slaves to one of the biggest kings ever, splits the ocean in half, s drops the ocean on the pharaoh's head, saves your life, takes you to the mountain. You start worshiping golden cows again. You start you start doing pagan ritualistic things again. You guys get free. You guys move up to Palestine and you go north. You start going in where the Canaanites are and, and, and everyone of, of the top, the Philistines. And you're still eating pork, you're still doing these things, you're still breaking your covenants, you're still breaking your laws, you're still not holding the Sabbath day, you're still doing all of these things. This is what the Jewish people do. And if you read the scriptures, it explains this so well. The Jewish people are very good at not listening to God. That's why they have a million laws that are placed on them. Every single time the Jewish people disobey God, God gives them more laws. And he says, okay, because you guys are a disobedient people, here's a thousand laws. Follow all a thousand laws and then you won't have a problem. But to, to, to sit here and like try and make the claim like, oh, they were still eating pork, so it must have not been bad. Jewish people are known to disobey God and known to do bad things and known, like they literally murdered their Messiah. They put Jesus on the cross, according to Christians, and murdered them. They worked with the Roman Empire, who is one of the biggest pagan empires of all time. The Roman Empire that burnt the original Torah and burnt it to pieces and destroyed the whole entire kingdom. It's crazy. Like, that people sit here and, 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 and they try and use, like, the, the Jewish people as, like, a good example. God just tells us, like, how much, how many, how many chances he gave the Jewish people and how many times they effed up and they cannot get it right. Like, they can just not get it right. So much so that they literally murdered their Messiah that was supposed to bring eternal, like, paradise to earth crazy to me ce the law we see in the torah might have been a mechanism of assimilating these northern jews into the southern culture that eschewed pork in time the pork taboo became a way for the israelites to distinguish themselves from the romans and then it became a way for the muslims who inherited the abrahamic tradition to distinguish themselves from say those dirty crusading franks with their filthy streets it's easy to imagine why the pork taboo spread we definitely can, like we don't not eat pork to differentiate ourselves from crusaders and that never was the case you think a whole population of people converted to a religion or a way of thinking so they didn't eat pork and another group of people ate pork so that they wouldn't be seen as the same are you mental maybe like they might wear different clothes to identify they're from a different tribe but to not eat pork because they eat pork is a very, very interesting claim that you're making. No, Muslims don't eat pork because God tells us not to, and we follow God. Jews don't eat pork because God tells them not to, and they follow God. Christians eat pork because God tells them not to, and they believe Jesus died for them to sin and drink and eat pork and have sex before marriage and do whatever they want, apparently. And yeah, but the, the, the way that you just made the claim that like Muslims fell into this taboo because they don't want to be associated with the crusaders is a wild claim and it is like very 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 like base level second grade weird claim and why it persists to the point where my pork recipes here in this global platform get noticeably fewer views than my other meat recipes but where the pork taboo first came from nobody knows for sure what i do know for sure is that people of all religions and it's not a taboo it came from god almighty 
came from God Almighty long, long, long before anyone knew there was diseases or anything linked to them, long before anyone knew they were dirty animals, long before they were in pens and being captive, uh, where they were wild animals running around. Long before, if you look at every single culture, like you said in Hinduism, there's something wrong with pork. If you look at Greek mythology, there's something wrong with pork. These are pagan societies. In pagan societies, they won't even eat pork. Now, we're talking about monotheistic societies, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Pork is forbidden. Like, it's not that hard um, to figure out. Like, there, there's probably there's probably no culture on the planet that doesn't speak against pork. It's an impure animal. It's an impure meat. There's, there's nothing to it. Like, dogs are impure. Like, there's a lot of impurities in, in specific animals. Like, it's, it's, it's not too hard to put together. It's not too hard to think of. But. Dietary codes can make a beautiful and functional website with Squarespace. Whether you want to... All right. So, video's over right there. Good video by Adam. Uh, it's good to hear, like, an outside opinion that's not coming from, like, a religious point of view, but just coming and objectively tackling the subject, talking about pork, what different, you know, historians said, what Jews say, what Christians say, what Muslims say, um, you know, what scientists say. So, it's good to hear this reflection. I think he's a cooking channel. He does cooking videos, so you can go ahead and check him out. I'll link the original video down below in the description. Thank you, everyone, for coming in today. I had to go ahead and just touch on, like, what the Quran says about it, what I believe about it, and what I see it as i could be wrong um the things that you or the way that you perceive what i say is up to you the way you perceive things is up to you but thank you guys so much for coming in today god bless every single one of you and until next time free palestine free the whole entire world from this deception and illness that is wreaking havoc upon us and until next time god bless and bye bye